No. Laws tell us we have to obey our parents. Laws tell us that we have to go to school. That sounds like a whole lot of restriction there, Pastor Phil. That's not liberty. No, what laws do is they put a, a nice, comfortable cushion all the way around you. And you're safe as long as you're inside that cushion. You don't have those laws, and then you go out and you're, whoa! <laughs> It is good to see such delightful faces. Some of them even smiling. Thank you, Chloe. But I need more than that. So let's pray. Our Lord God, we again gather for another one of those Bible talks. And indeed, Father, it can be nothing more to us than just another lesson unless your Spirit comes and works through this speaker and works through the hearts of each listener. Allow us, Father, to be your tools to understand what you have for each of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We are on page, whatever the page is, 17 in your notebook. I'm impressed with the good notes that you all take. Of course, there's a reason for it because you get points I understand that. I encourage you in your church to be in the habit of taking notes. Get a notebook, um, have some paper with you, whatever. And my bulletin, I put an outline on the back of the bulletin, much like this, that will have blanks to fill in. Um, not nearly as elaborate as Pastor Steve did, uh, but I encourage people to take notes. I also encourage you to actually open your Bibles and look at what the pastor's saying. Make sure he's got the verse right. Uh, actually, just search the scriptures for yourself. So I hope you have your Bibles open to James 1, except for those of you who memorized it. But even you, I'd encourage you to have it open to James chapter 1. My topic tonight, as you see, heartfelt service. It's in the notes. It's on the wall there. Heartfelt service from James chapter 1, starting verse 19. But before we go there, I just thought it was interesting to note that the verse 17, that's why it's good to have your Bibles open, that talks about the gifts we have come from God, every good, every perfect gift, that verse goes on to talk about one of the gifts being the word of truth in verse 18. And then the ne very next word that begins my section is wherefore, or therefore, or so then, depending on what translation you have. In other words, it follows directly. If I say that Pastor Samuel just went out and bought a whole bunch more ice cream, therefore, you're going to listen to what the therefore is, because it ties into that ice cream. Did you get us more? No, never mind. The therefore connects it to what came before. So this is not a sermon by Pastor Steve Okay, we're done with his sermon. We're all done. Now let's hear what, what Mr. Bean has to say. And he has a whole different separate sermon. And then let's get a sermon. It, it doesn't work that way. This is God's word written by one person, a guy by the name of James. And he has gone and, and written not sermons. It's not a book on sermons. It is a, a letter that he wrote to people. And the thoughts follow through. Remember that. Remember that whenever you read the Bible. Is this part here entirely separate from the part before? As most of the Psalms are that way. In Proverbs, sometimes the verse isn't really connected to the next verse. They are just sayings. Not just, but as far as being connected. So get the connection there. So what we had before and all from verse 1 led up to that. So then, because we have the word of truth as one of those gifts, it is important to see what comes next, starting in verse 19 and following. These gifts, in fact, follow the warnings of verses 1 through 15, the warnings about trials, warnings about temptations. And so in the midst of that, we get to, or at the end of that, we get to this every good gift comes from God, there in verse 17. And one of those gifts is the word of truth. In verse 18, therefore, well, we're not up to there yet. But in the midst of that, verses 1 through 
18, get my verses right, there was a warning there about not being deceived in verse 16. So that connects. Verse 16, don't be deceived. Verse 17, because you have these gifts from God, and one of those gifts is the word of truth. So what do we do with this? What are we going to learn about this and the flow there? And by the way, it certainly connects with what comes afterwards through verse 25, and then what we'll get tomorrow night through the end of the chapter. This is not only important information for understanding James, but it's, under, it's important for understanding God's Word. It's part of the greatness of God's Word. That although there's a continuous thought often throughout a book, throughout a chapter, throughout a section of verses, each one of those can really be a sermon. As I was going through this, it was not an issue of, oh boy, what am I going to preach on? Oh, let's see. Uh, it was like, okay, here, nope, I got to take that out. That'll make it too long. Nope, can't preach on that part there. And I had to keep whittling it down, keep getting fewer and fewer because we'd be here all night for me just to try and cover this passage even a little bit. That's the beauty of God's, that's part of the beauty of God's word is that there's so much here. That's why we don't just read it. That's why we encourage you to study it. Each part has an important lesson. Now, most deceivers in verse, such as reference in verse 16, like to go the opposite. They like to find a Bible verse that proves what they want to say. They prove what they want to be true, and then they'll use that verse to deceive others. I want to talk to the high school students for a moment. You all can listen, because you're going to be high school students someday. But high school students, I'm talking seventh grade and up, you are already in a place very vulnerable to being deceived. Satan is trying to find people to speak into your ears, not just the things that, that Mr. Rob was talking about tonight where people are trying to get you to do the wrong stuff, but trying to get you to believe the wrong stuff. And so they're going to find out you're a Christian and say, oh, well, you know the Bible says this, or the Bible doesn't really say that. You need to know what the Bible says. And so when your faith gets challenged, what you're being taught right now is being challenged, you get back with your pastor. Get back with any of the pastors. Call us. I'm a, a, just, that's fine. It doesn't matter if you're part of my congregation. And say, this is what I was taught, and I don't understand it. And pastors, you better be honest with the Word of God. Don't give a, a, a casual answer. Oh, well, that probably... Uh, you, let's do our homework. Let's study out and say, okay, here's what I know is true. Because the deception is so great, and we're seeing it so much more now than it was certainly when I was a child, at least in different forms, in more blatant forms. So be careful of that. Take note of that. James chapter 1, starting verse 19. Who memorized the whole chapter of James? One, two, three, four, five. Would you five come up here, please? I was impressed that Pastor Steve quoted his verses. I studied to try and do it, and I thought, why? Why? I got people who can already do this. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you verse 18. And then what, what translation did you memorize? King James? ESV. ESV? Okay. Well, same, same, yep. King James Version. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, I, uh, this is not a competition. I'm impressed that they memorized as well as they memorized, whether it's perfect, whether it's close, or whatever else. But I'm going to give you verse 18, then you pick up with verse 19. I'll stop you. You go on with verse 20. I'll stop you. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Is that okay? You can do that? All right. Verse 18, I had the new King James, but hopefully you can follow that, Micah. Of those, no, Micah? You are Micah, right? Yeah, okay. Of those, I'm learning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Loud, loud. Oh, oh, no, no, 21.
<laughs> what he just said. He is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. Is that the one you said, or did you say the one after that? Okay. He sees himself in the mirror. Go ahead. Uh, after a natural face in the mirror, do you remember what comes next? For he observes. He looks at himself. Thank you all. Thank you very much. All right, let's get down to business here. I want to look at the best part of this passage first. You ready for the best part? It is in verse 21. It is, why is this going crazy? There we go. It is the verse before. There's a verse. This speaks of the superfluity of naughtiness. Is there a better expression in all of the English language than the superfluity of naughtiness. It just sort of flows out of us. Superfluity of naughtiness. I first came across, I don't know how old I was when I first came across that, but I have loved that expression forever. Say it with me. Let me, let me give you just that part there. Here we go. Superfluity of naughtiness. That's when the, the King James Version. Anybody smart enough to know why my computer's doing this? Uh, that's where we're going to be. Oh, that was what was written there. Superfluity of naughtiness. You need to get that so you can copy it down. The superfluity of naughtiness. I just love that expression. It, is, it, it, it flows. It feels good. It, it's, it's probably, I, I don't think Shakespeare has anything better than that. Superfluity of naughtiness. And uh, let's say it again. Superfluity of naughtiness. Yeah, see, that just feels so good. Since it's in the Bible, I, actually, I thought one of the things you could do with this Someday you're going to have your own bank account, and with your own bank account, you're going to need a password. This is a great password. <laughs> I have a bank account that got hacked, and they told me I had to change it. I got a new bank account. They, they gave me all my money back and whatever else. They said, you're going to need a password. So I chose one of my favorite theological words. Trans I'm sorry, not trans uh, infralapsarianism. In, infralapsarianism, a great word. Now you can all, all go rob my bank. Infralapsarianism. Or maybe I did superlapsarianism. But like this, I mean, if you had this, even if you're talking to the teller, the teller says, what's your password? And you go, it's superfluity of naughtiness. And somebody overhears you, they're going to think, what did he say? Superflu a bee? <laughs> a stupid see a tree? What, what did he say? So they can't even steal it from you. But I, I mean, it's just great. But since it's in the Bible, we ought to find out what it means. Because I learned this word, these words, this phrase so long ago, but I didn't really know what it meant until last month. Because I never had a reason to look it up. I mean, I sort of knew what it meant. Super means something big or powerful or something. Naughtiness is, is doing the wrong thing. But, but I never actually looked up what those words were in the English, let alone in the original Greek. And so I thought, okay, do your homework here. And it's not a hard thing as you think through what superfluity would be. Super means lots of. You've got a, a super amount of or super quality of something. It is more than normal. That's a super part. Fluidity comes from the same word that fluid comes from in the English. And it is flow or flowing. So super flowing, large flow, or as in some translation, overflowing, the overflowing. So the overflowing of badness, the overflowing of mischief, uh, those don't do it. No, no. You got to have the overflowing of naughtiness. Stop it. Stop it. It just rolls off the tongue better. Superfluity of naughtiness, not superfluity of badness or, or whatever else. And actually this word even 
naughtiness, it causes some confusion here because I don't know what you think of the word naughty, but I think the word naughty is when you pull your sister's pigtails, you hide your brother's toys, that's being naughty. But the word behind this, the word that James used, the Greek word, are those very common and very powerful words, evil, wickedness. So we have the overflowing of wickedness. Suddenly that's not such a nice phrase. It's not near as much fun as superfluity of naughtiness to say the overflowing of wickedness. And I was going to spend a little bit of time here talking about this wickedness idea, but Mr. Rob did such a good job that today. I hope you were paying attention. When he got you all saying, what's evil, and you were throwing out all those things, like, like lying and stealing and cheating. Oops. <laughs> I'm not in an ice bucket game, it's not cheating, if you put your own spoon in there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, uh, it, it, those, those are really bad things. And yeah, they are really bad things, and I'm not going to go into all the rest of that, but I wonder how many of you have seen Frozen 1? Oh, good. How many of you have seen Tangled? Oh, good. Because when I think of wickedness, let's go with that woman who claimed to be Rapunzel's mother. She kidnapped Rapunzel, the queen's daughter. She hid her in a tower, which might as well have had prison bars on it because she couldn't get down, or at least mom didn't think so. She kept her away. And remember the time when Rapunzel was saying, I want to go out and see the lights? And mom kept playing, no, no, no. Finally, she says, Rapunzel, you're never leaving this tower. That's wicked. How about Hans from the Southern Isles? Yeah, that handsome, good-looking dude there that's going to uh, win the heart of poor little Anna and then tries to kill both Anna and Elsa. That's wickedness. So when you see this naughtiness idea here, don't think of it about pulling the pigtail type stuff, hiding the, the baby's blanket or something. No, no, this is, this is really... Well, so why is James telling us to lay aside this overflowing of wickedness? I'm not a wicked person. I'm not a... I, I don't steal things. I, I'm not... Well, what did you hear today about if you were in a sterile operating room, how many germs would it take... To make it unsterile? One. So, you are wicked if you have one sin. Yeah, pulling the sister's pigtails. In fact, if you have not even committed a sin, if that's possible, just your sin nature that Pastor Samuel talked about. We are sinners. Now, I knew it. Coming up like this, I forgot my bag. Because I want to illustrate, it's not a great illustration, but I hope it, it brings the thought home here a little bit. Um, you all like to color, don't you? I have a coloring book here. It's a little different coloring book, and I know at least some of you have seen this, this coloring book here. It says it's a, a fun, magic coloring book. But I want to use it to illustrate a little bit about what, what sin might be because of what we need to do about that sin. So it's just a coloring book here. It's a, see, it's sort of a circus theme there. And we have all these nice pictures here. Uh, the guy selling tickets, and that looks like a magician of some kind there, and, and bunny rabbits, and okay, like that. Now, what I need is, would you stand up? You got lots of good color on that. May I rub on your, on your arm here, here? I just want to get a little bit of that pink off of there, a little bit of blue there, and a little bit of that sort of purple pink there. Thank you. Now take that. And I shake it up real well. Okay, now, the, what you first saw in the pictures, you just saw the black outlines. That's a sinful nature. Everybody on there had sinful nature. Now, we add a little bit of color to it, and that is also sin. All of that is sin. It, it, it's not pretty, it's sin. And, and we see that's what the, the other ones had. They had all that sin inside of them the whole time. And now it's all visible for. What are you all making such faces about? Anyway, so what we need to do, we have sin in us. We have, we have sin in us. And we need to get rid of that sin. And I'm going to borrow your white shirt, may I? 
I just want to get a little bit right here. Actually, lean forward. Let me get it from the back because that's more white. Okay, thank you very much. And so, if we have something that will cleanse us of our sin, it does indeed remove all of the sin stain. Okay? Now, that's just a cheap little magic trick. I, it's, anybody can do this magic trick. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll sell you the book for $400, and you can do your... <laughs> I, I actually do much more entertaining magic. I don't think we'll have time for it this week, but if you want, I can do some other things at some point. But the, the, my, my point there is just giving you the idea that yeah, just the, they, the little nature of sin and the outlines, and then when you can see inside, they're, they're whole full of sin, and that's not those murderers and those thieves. It's the cheaters, even at the bucket game. It's the pulling of the pigtails and hiding the baby's blanket. It's not doing the work you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. It's the things we do that we're not supposed to do. It's the things that we don't do that we were supposed to do. Those are all sins, and those are all inside of us. And so, when James says here, we need to lay aside the superfluity of naughtiness, the overflowing of wickedness, he is not just talking to those bad people. He's talking to this pastor and these other pastors, and these other adults, and the teenagers, and the children all the way down to the front row because we all have that same curse that's called sin, and we need to get rid of that. We need to do away with the superfluity of naughtiness. I just love that phrase. How do we do that? Well, let's get, we've got the best part. Let's get on to, that's a magic trick. That's what it is. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Let's get to the main part now. Ready for the main part of this passage here? What to do with this word of truth from verse 18? What do we do with the word of truth? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing we need to do... Hey, it worked that time. Nope, it didn't. There we go. Is to listen. So then, my beloved brethren, verse 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That's kind of an odd collection of of phrases there. What does it mean to be quick to listen? What is it to be slow to speak? I guess we know what wrath is. That's anger. But what is it to be slow to wrath? Well, it's not all that hard here. When you decide, when you're listening to somebody, you decide you know what they're going to say. Sort of like when Miss Roseanne's up here and she asks you questions. When the missionary, boom, somebody's on their feet. And they answer the question. Well, they answer a question, but it's not always the question she was going to ask. That's swift to speak. How much better for getting points, and I know sometimes you get it right. Good job, y'all. But how much better would it be if you had been slow to speak and swift to hear? If you'd, okay, let me hear a little bit more. Let me hear, let me hear the word India or the word China or something that I'll get a good idea. Oh, okay, now I'm ready to get up. I, I know enough information. See, that's what it is. We talk about, be, be really ready to hear. Listen. Listen to what God has to say. Don't be jumping ahead and saying, oh, okay, I know what that is. And, and, and you end up doing some really stupid things sometimes. How many of you have seen Frozen 2? Uh, fewer, but most of you, I guess. In Frozen 2, Kristoff wants to propose to Anna. Remember that bit? And he's just really nervous. He doesn't know what to say. <laughs> he's, um, and so he tries to find some way to sort of introduce it. And there are a whole series of these. But one of them that came to my mind was they're off on this journey that could end up being a dangerous journey. And Christoph says, y- you know, uh, uh, how does he say that? I got it my notes somewhere. Anybody know they can tell me? Um, what's no, he doesn't say it that way. He says, uh, hey, I didn't write it down here. Uh, just in case we don't make it back. That's what he says. Just in case we don't make it back. And Anna, being swift to speak and slow to hear, goes, what, you think we're going to die? Oh, no. And she goes off on this big thing about it. And every time he tries to, to ask her to marry him, and he starts it off, she goes off about, oh, no, we can't, da, 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 because she is swift to speak instead of being slow to speak. Slow to hear instead of being swift to hear. So the first thing we need to do is spend time listening listening. What is it we need to be listening to in God's Word? Well, frankly, anything that's in God's Word. 
We need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Sometimes when you get into this habit of being swift to speak, it leads to anger real easily. There is actually a whole other sermon, at least, on how this word wrath, how the anger fits in here. I'm going to let it go at that. But don't get angry either. You need to be slow before getting angry. That's, that's an important issue there. Okay, so um, slow to speak allows us to hear what is necessary. We need to listen. I learned to do that very early in my life. Part of what I want to do here is let you get to know me a little bit. And I'm going to share something that surprisingly a lot of people don't know. I, I'm not embarrassed by it much anymore. Uh, but when I was little, I must have been a very excitable child. And, and yes, you can confirm this with Miss Roseanne later, my much older sister. She's younger sister. But uh, as a young child, I would be so excited, I guess, that I would speak in falsetto. Falsetto is a thing that guys have, actually, I think girls also have a falsetto. And that is, where you talk like this. Now, most guys don't talk like this unless they're making fun of girls, okay? But as a child, before my voice had changed to this low voice, I talked in falsetto. I remember my father telling me, go call the kids for dinner. I'd say, Bob, Ned, Jack, Donald, Roseanne, Lauren, and Dorothy. And he'd say, use your sheriff voice. Bob, Ned, Jack, Donald. And so I, know, I had this other voice. I didn't know this until I was 15 years old. My voice had changed. You know, guys, eventually, they, they, they all talk high, and then their voice gets lower. My voice had changed, but I didn't know it because I thought this was my voice. I went to try out for an elite choir in high school at 15 years of age, and I was a tenor, of course, with that. That's a high men part. Actually, I was really more of an alto or soprano. But uh, the, the instructor, amazing woman, she said, okay, uh, here's some music. I want you to read the music. And I was pretty good at reading music. And I start singing, and she says, you're singing in falsetto. I said, no, I'm not. She says, you're talking in falsetto. I said, no, I'm not. She said, can you talk lower? And I said, well, I can talk down here. You know, that's, I always thought it was just sort of growling. I can talk down here. And then this. And she said, that's your real voice. No, it's not. <laughs> well, the advantage of that was it was somewhat embarrassing, knowing that my voice was different than other people. And so as a result, I kept my mouth shut a lot. And I learned to be quick to hear and slow to speak just because I didn't want to be made fun of again or to look stupid or whatever else. I don't encourage you to talk in falsetto, boys. I don't encourage you to do something, but, but it is a good thing to learn to be slow to speak, as slow to speak, to be quick to hear. An old rabbi, actually, it's an old story. I don't know if the rabbi was old at the time, but he said... It is a, a, a marvelous thing that God has given each of us two ears that cannot be closed and only one mouth that can be closed. We should listen at least twice as much as we speak. Be s quick to hear. Be slow to speak. And with that comes slow to wrath. Next thing. It's always a fear here when I do it. Nope. After we listen, we are to receive the truth. Let's go on to the rest of 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness in the New King James and receive with, ah, oh, man. What direction are we going now? I don't even know where we're headed here. You got the whole sermon now. Okay. Oh, great. All right. Magic tricks, I tell you, they're all magic tricks. All right, uh, we need to not just listen to the word, we need to receive the word. That's what it says here in verse 21. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Listen, don't jump ahead, Anna. He's trying to ask you to marry him. Just shut up and listen. We need... To listen. Receive the word that God gives you as he gives it to you, not the way you want it to be. Well, I think this verse should really say, I don't care what you think that verse should say. What does God say? This is God's word we're talking about here. And it's true. And there are smart people who say lots of words that aren't true. Which one should we listen to? The one that's always right. I'm in favor of that. 
So listen and receive the word with meekness. Meekness, the way I've always thought of meekness is, is choosing, let me get it the way I have here, to appear weak even when you're strong. You don't have to win the argument. Somebody else comes in, and the argument really is not important, so you go, okay, thanks, appreciate your thoughts. Your, the thoughts may be wrong, but it doesn't really matter in that conversation. You look like you lost the argument. That's meekness. Choosing to appear weak even though you're strong. And I thought that's interesting, and, and in fact, just going over my notes again today, it dawned on me, anger is just the opposite. Anger is choosing to appear strong when you're really weak. I had a run in a couple weeks ago with a girl. I was trying to help her and her boyfriend, I think. Actually, I was trying to help the guy and his girlfriend. I didn't even know her. And I just watched her run over people, bully people. And if they didn't do what she wanted, she would just say the same thing louder. And then she kept doing it until she started to boss me around. <laughs> and she got so angry at me because I said, no, no, I'm not doing that. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, she got very angry. She was weak. Her logic was weak. Her plans were weak. Her, oh, I, I, it was an amazing thing just to see an exhibit of somebody who gets angry out of their weakness. That's free. You don't have to pay for that. That's a side note. Okay, so how will you know if you have really received the word? How do you know that you've got the spirit of meekness, the implanted word? And it's interesting, the implanted word there, that means it's not word that you go and find. The Holy Spirit's working in you. Again, another sermon there. We need to move on. And what do we do about this? Verse 22, we know it because we are doers of the word and not hearers only. Doers of the word. That's the key. If you have uh, the ability to draw a key next to that, letter C, uh, Roman numeral 2, do the word. Draw a key. That's the key of this passage here. Uh, maybe much more than the passage. I didn't compare it with the rest of the chapter of the book. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. So I hear that God wants me not to cheat. And so they call me out there to be tortured. And I choose not to cheat because, and, and I don't think I was sinning. I think I was having fun. But if that were the case, I, I, I would be, I, the thing to do is just do what God says. God tells you to listen to your authorities, listen to your parents, obey them, obey the authorities, obey the speed limits drivers. See how many heads go down right with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we need to obey, God tells us to do that. So if God says it, we obey. Not enough just to read it. Oh, that's very interesting that God wants that. Mm -hmm. No, no, do it. Do what God says, all right? So that's very simple there. In fact, if you're not doing that, the end of verse 22, you are deceiving yourselves. Verse 16 talked about being deceived, the idea there of somebody else is deceiving you. How foolish of you to deceive yourself? But that's what happens. You may be reading God's word, maybe not, but you're not doing it whether you're reading it or not. Listen. Receive and do. Because, an interesting illustration here, verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word but not a doer, you hear it but you're not doing it, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I don't know if you've ever done that. You ever gone in there just to do that final check before you go off to school, and then you go away and you go, is my hair combed? I mean, you're just looking at yourself in the mirror, but you weren't paying enough attention even to notice that. If you're looking at the Word of God and doing it, then you know whether your hair was combed, <laughs> to use that illustration there. Moving on. We hear God's Word and we agree uh, we need to change, and then we walk away from, from thinking we're okay. Or worse yet, maybe we look at the mirror and we think we're fine when we're really not. I, heard, I, I read one preacher on this passage in my research. He said, um, grandchildren are some of the best things for being mirrors. <laughs> You know, hey, you know what? I'm 69 years old. I'm looking pretty good. So I go over to my son's house, and Kenzie says, Papa, you're getting fat. <laughs> Thanks, kid. <laughs> Honesty. That's a true mirror for me. I can see what's going on here. What we need to do, what this is talking about here, is wisdom. Having wisdom. You see yourself as you are. And in verse 5, 
James tells us we need to, verse 5 of chapter 1, he tells us that we need to be wise. You know, there's a song about that. How'd that go? The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise, and because, yeah, you know that one, right? And then there's the other part. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Well, what is that about? I mean, what, what's the rest of that? Well, let me tell you what the rest of that is. If I can make my computer work. Oh, there's the do, sorry. Let's get the do. Everybody's got the do from letter C? All right, here it is. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, this is from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. What Jesus is talking about here is the wise people are the ones who listen and do. Let's go on to verse 26 without making a mess here. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them like a foolish man who built the house upon the sand. That whole song is about, are you going to listen to God and do it? Or are you going to listen and turn away and forget you were looking in the mirror? Be wise. Be wise. All right. So how do we do this? How do we actually put into practice that we are going to do what God says? First thing is you are looking into something here. Looking, verse 25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, you need to look carefully. Laws are restricted. It's interesting, he's telling us to look in the law. Look at the perfect law of liberty. What's that? The fact is, laws make us free. What? Laws tell us how fast we can't go by telling us how fast we, the fastest we can go. Laws tell us we have to obey our parents. Laws tell us that we have to go to school. That sounds like a whole lot of restriction there, Pastor Phil. That's not liberty. No, what laws do is they put a, a nice, comfortable cushion all the way around you. And you're safe as long as you're inside that cushion. You don't have those laws, and then you go out and you're... <laughs> because you're outside of your cushion. You're outside of your safe area. Laws are actually good, and especially God's laws, which are made specifically for us, and in fact, specifically for each of us, you, God made law with you in mind. Don't run, wear a life jacket when you're on the boat, uh, pick up your toys and your clothes. Those laws there help make our lives better if we do them. God's law makes our lives as good as it can be. So let's look at this perfect law of liberty. And going on with 25, uh, the one who looks at the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in what he does. So I'm always afraid of this. Yep. So we ha what we have here is a cycle. If you will look in the law, look in God's word, and you continue in it, verse 25, then you is, are, are a doer of the word. And as a doer of the word, then you get blessed by God. And one who's blessed by God will continue to look into the word. And the one looking in the word will continue and continue. You got that cycle going there in verse 25 that God provides for us to keep us safe. I want to bring this to an end here. The third thing is how do we experience godly, oops, superfluity? How do we experience godly superfluity or experiencing godly superfluity? What can I do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because this word here, translated in the King James as superfluity, here in James, is translated other ways elsewhere in the Bible, but it's used fairly often. And there are a number of places we're told to exercise superfluity, to be superfluidacious. I just made that word. I didn't make, just make it. I made it up earlier today or yesterday. I can't remember. Is that the next one on here? Um, now let's go with this first. For example... Grace, you can be overflowing with grace, superfluid with grace, superfluity of grace. You can be, let me get this, superfluitaciously, <laughs> superfluitaciously with grace. You can be, I came up, with, that's an adverb, here's the adjective that I made up, well, wrong way. Superfluitaceous would be the adjective. Those are not in the dictionary. I tried to find the adjective and adverb of that form, superfluity. Let's go back to, it stayed there. 
Grace. Grace. What is grace? Grace is simply unmerited favor. I would like my James 1 memorizers to come back up here again. Come on. James 1 memorizers, come up here again. One, two, three, four, one more, five. Come on up here, Micah. All right. Now, why did you memorize James 1? Okay, because it was the thing for camp. Why did you memorize? It's cheaper. How was it cheaper? <laughs> That's good, good. That's a good answer. Why? Because of how paid for camp, right? Okay. Why did you memorize James 1? Both of those, okay. Why why'd you memorize, Grant? Scholarship. Why did you memorize James 1? Okay, and you're all here at camp. So that means you've gotten paid for memorizing James 1, right? You're not owed anything else for James 1, right? Good, because what I have is I want to thank you for memorizing James 1. But you didn't earn this, did you? I'm not giving you this because you memorized James 1. I'm giving you this just because you're up front here and no one else is. <laughs> and John is back there memorizing real fast. So, this is grace. They didn't earn these. They're, you can go back and sit down now. They didn't earn these. They got these just because they gave them to them. And I could give them to, but I'm not going to. <laughs> if you had said superfluity, you may have gotten away with it, Samuel. That's grace. It's unmerited. It's unearned. And when we talk about God's grace, which is talked about here, for the, if by the one man's offense, talk about Adam, many died. Adam died. Um, Adam's sin, many died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. That's that superfluity. Superfluity of grace that God gives us. Now I want to give you another definition of grace. G R A C E. That's grace. Let's put a word with each one. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's grace to his people is not limited to salvation. It's not limited to my belonging to Jesus and Jesus belonging to me. God's riches. Heaven's riches are at my disposal because I earned it. No, I didn't earn it. Because I'm a pastor. No, not because I'm a pastor. God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus paid for that grace. Jesus paid for me to have access to all of God's riches. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. This grace is available, a superfluity of grace. How about, let's get past our adverbs, hope. Hope is the next one there, number two. Romans 15, verse 13. Now, many, now may the hope, God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Get overflowing hope from God. Superfluity of hope. And you know what? These things you can pass on to other people. You tell people about Jesus, they become Christians, they have the superfluity of grace for them. You exhibit and talk to people about the hope you have, the confidence you have that you're going to heaven, and you, they can have the superfluity of hope. What else do we have? These are all the same word here in the Greek. Let's go on to building others up. How about if we build others up? 1 Corinthians 14. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the building up, the edification of the church, that you may seek to excel. That, you notice the green there is the superfluity every time. Superfluity of the, the building up of the church. Next one, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, unmovable, always superfluity, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The work that we do for the Lord can be superfluity work. See these do things? Don't be just a hearer. Be a do we can do these things. How about 
suffering and comfort. Now this says that their sufferings of Christ are superfluid, superfluitatious, yeah, superfluitatious in us. Um, they, they abound in us. So our comfort, our consolation is superfluitous in us as well. We can abound in these things because of Christ. We move on. Thanksgiving. We, oh, we should always be overflowing with thanksgiving. Superfluity of thanksgiving. That's something that you can all do right now as you're sitting there silently saying, thank you, Lord, he's almost done. If that's what you want to thank the Lord for. Thank you, Lord, that, that I'm at camp. Thank you, Lord, for the time that that adult spent with me talking to me. Thank you, Lord, for these friends I made. And, and, and just let that be overflowing of thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I could spend an hour easily just ticking off things I'm thankful for. What keeps me from doing that is I get stuck on some of them going, oh God, that is so great. I just need to talk some more about how wonderful it is. And usually like around my children, grandchildren, my wife, that I get stuck on that. But so much thanksgiving we have. Overflowing, superfluity of thanksgiving. I didn't read the verse. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to overflow, abound, superfluity to the glory of God. And you can do that, share that with others as well. How about joy and sharing? That in great trial reflections that come, the superfluity of their joy. And in the deep poverty, the superfluity of their riches. Well, there are a lot of things we can, we can just overflow with as we're doing God's word, as we are not just hearers. How about everything? Faith, speech, knowledge. This is here in the verse, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. As you abound, as you are superfluitatious in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you also are superfluitatious. That's getting tough. In, in, in this grace also. What do I need to do? I'm a hearer of the word. What you do, it's not what you need to do, it's what you get to do. And of course, the big one here that we love so much is love. And this I pray, Paul says, that your love may exhibit superfluity still more, overflowing still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. How about just one to summarize the whole thing? And God is able to make all grace overflow toward you, abound here, superfluity that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance, superfluity, overflowing for every good work. That's, these are just a few of the verses that, that use this, just this one word, superfluity. It's translated that way. In fact, I'd like you to turn to the beginning of your notes. Turn back to 17. With apologies to Steve or whoever came up with the titles, I'm going to change the title of the sermon. I want you to change the title to title two. The superfluity of service. Put, scratch out the heartfelt. I want you to, as you read the word and you become doers of the word, it's not just, okay, I've got to do this. It's, I get to do this. I get to do this overflowing and abundantly. The superfluity of service. Let's pray. Father, It is so often the case